you can describe your class to any class in this community. And thankfully, you can fill the group with young subjects, so thank you very much. Um, you give us a lot to think about, and I'd like to have a conversation about just a couple of things before we, we deal with some questions. One, your organization, just like our organization, I think Ken Fox is still with us sitting over here, and we'll agree with this, we face a real accountability challenge. We face an accountability challenge in education of are we delivering the value for tuition dollars for struggling families whose children aspire to be able to leave the story that we told. And World Vision and other organizations face an accountability challenge of stewardship of their schools to make sure they're going to act in that story. Give us lots of statistics. The great fear of we teach a trauma is that we'll teach to the test. That it will look at are we lifting people above two dollars a day and stopping at two dollars and a penny a day? Are we going to get people clean water or fresh water as premium when it doesn't really satisfy all of their kids? And World Vision is a very inspiring motto of advancing children's capacity to life in all its forms. So tell us about how you face this accountability challenge and this vision of what you want to achieve. Well, I know there's a good question and then there's a good question. And, uh, you know, first of all, every organization needs to be accountable to the organization that's in front of them. So we need to work pretty hard at that. And I'm the first to say, it's like I've been in the first thing that they should be done some mistakes and some of the way that. And so we all have to think back to what is our motivation and how are we being accountable. And accountable to the poor and accountable to our community. And so, you know, one track I can say that I need to do is measurement and impact and evidence. And, and, and we are moving from a very aggressive toward an evidence based model of economic development. And we spent 63 years developing our approach to helping the poor and we developed some pretty sophisticated strategies and program management interventions. And it is hard to measure some of these things. As you know, as an academic, you measure the best person and you measure the best tree. And uh, to measure changes in human behavior and change, changes in values and attitudes, uh, to measure child well being, it's not all that easy. And even for us working with parents, you know, it's not always me- easy to measure our own child's children's well being, you know, and are we providing the right things for them. But we really do strive to do that, and we are undertaking that in front of every one of our 1,500 class periods in the world. We're doing baseline surveys and safety surveys and around child well being. And I can try to list those today in class probably. But I made the point today that I might have been clear in some of the statements I just made that you know, poverty is not just about children and bringing the same water back home or cardboard and that and having them in the We can provide more homes and we can provide better safety. We can work with people who are much below and have an opportunity to make a change and create some sense of pride and mortality. Um, there's a lot of tricks in our bag that we can use in the community that are like what I would call kind of hardware inputs to the community to change the way that the vaccination cycle works. Uh, that is perhaps you know, the line used in farm labor. Actually, the software of our work tends to be even more important than that in years. You're dealing with human beings. A lot of poverty happens in three to six years. You know, poverty is social, poverty is psychological, uh, it's cultural. And you can ask the question, why do we have poverty in the United States when we don't have the same amount, we don't have the schools, we don't have the schools, we, we have all those things, but one in five of American children is in poverty. It's because poverty is also a class of uh, the value system and the way we live culturally in the U.S. And what you know is reality of what you experience. So a lot of the work of World Vision is in the software area, teaching the whole culture to think about girls and women differently in the name of historical sense, making women full participants in the community. I always say that a, 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 a soccer team that only takes half of their best players on the field doesn't win the game. So we try to encourage people to put all of their best players on the field and play the game and also to teach young children. Um, we work on 
basic principles of right and wrong and values and caring for one another and so and finally getting cooperative and so on. And we can work together in a small group of people to get a kind of responsibility to do it individually. We leave behind kind of a civil society structure and governing the life of the education system. We work with local uh, churches and try to strengthen churches on the ground of the But we also work with Muslims and Emirates and other religious groups because they're poor as well, right? You know, they have resources in their community and they need to be done. So all of these kind of software programs, things of that nature, things of value, um, those are important aspects of our work that actually we have been asking for the Christian community. For the Christian, I believe the most powerful software program of all is the gospel. Because it changes the only thing I know is truly changes human beings from the inside out. Because all the other stuff tries to change it from the outside in. And uh, so, in appropriate ways and respectful ways, we try to share what we believe to be the truth of the gospel. And the principles and the scripture that talk about how we live with one another, where we don't hold any kind of very vertical relationship with one another. But we do it respectfully. We don't proselytize. We don't force people to listen to our religious message. We do it with respect. We claim the right to speak into their lives because we walk with them as if they're a Christian and we know the scriptures. And we walk with them as the kind of Christian we need to talk about and to work with them in their lives. Can you reflect for a few minutes on what you see as the role of the university partnering with? Providing science to the young staff for the world, or to the whole accountable, whatever the roles you see the universities working with NGOs, like what you do, what is their place in all this? What's the, what's the scope of partnership that you do? Well, I think it's going to happen more and more because what's happening is universities have a lot of breakthroughs in theory and in technology and methodology for understanding poverty with all of its very technical dimensions. Um, and, you know, simple analogy is if, if the university develops a new vaccine for malaria, it's worthless to what some of the operational ideas in the world. And so, the real vision about the operational side is delivering these services and things that they are um, in hopefully effective ways and the ways that those services can be used. Um, so, innovation can like come up with an applied economics, understanding the global food market to one channel. Uh, if we can operationalize those things and bring layers of the ivory tower into the community where we can do it and where we can just take it off the bear, um, it can be very important that the intellectual capital is being built on. And you know, the Gates Foundation is kind of based on the idea of kind of creating this intellectual capital around poverty, around global health, around global development, so that it can be operationalized and put into I think the uh, real vision is going to be to do more partnerships with universities. Um, and you, you might be the brains that go to Braun, right? And they'll say, you've got the ideas and the theories, and we've got the laboratories and the boots on the ground that can make sure these things can be used to do. And so it's really a great partnership. And in some ways, we can't really work without one another because you know, we need the whole value chain. So you, you told us a fascinating story about your own path to this. this extremely impactful position. And there are quite a few young people out there that some of them have to have thought that they wanted a life that might change the world the way you are. And others of them have probably thought they would like that kind of better account that you still have or available for a song. You know, what do you have to say to the young students we have here at the high school school who, who sometimes like to use the tagline teaching the next generation of leaders to do well and to be good, to, to empower them with food gifts that enable them to go out and, and realize their aspirations for themselves, but also for society. But what's the path to accomplish that? Well, it's what is it? Yeah, well, you know, it's hard. Now, first of all, you know, the students in the community who are coming in, you know, do understand the value of the work. You know, some of the most privileged students in the world just have to understand the university and the work that they do and they can find it. Here's the thing, you can take all of that intellectual horsepower and all of that knowledge and ability that you get with, you can take it to Wall Street and make a hundred million dollars, buy yourself the biggest yacht in the world, and buy yourself ten of those ten bucket mansions in China. You can do that using the same intellectual capital that you have. Or you can invest that intellectual capital in something 
that really can't be the Or you can make that hundred million and give it to provision and then we'll figure it out. Um, and I'm not saying, and I don't want to suggest that every person who wants to change the world is the worst that they can do. You know, we need people with good hearts, good values, and want to make a difference in the world for good. We need them to follow them. We need them to have to do it. We need them 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 to do Every perception. You know, the gospel in the kingdom of God, as I read it, is about those of us who are Christians going into the world with the idea of rebuilding, preparing, reforming, redeeming every generation of people and making it more Christ like in the ways we interact with people. And uh, we can do that with joy and rejoicing and family. Uh, we can be peacemakers and all of us. But I'm going to get back to my lecture and it's about choosing the values that you're under operating under. So for the first thing, I kind of try to say this, is this a glory about or not? 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 If it isn't, I'm going to try not to do it. And if it is, I'm going to try to do it. It's like a spiritual north star. You don't have to be a Christian to have a, a North Star of reality and the perception of the church. People don't believe in that the reality. They can't have a strong North Star of the church. They do. You know, some of the secular humanitarian churches wouldn't have changed that way. They would have to change the church. Okay. One last question before we open the rest of the floor. So, my family is not to be a Christian church. Amen, brother. Um, and I've always marveled at how you have essentially a retail business model. You rely on, I think you told us, it's about three and a half or four million people around the world like me paying basically a dollar a day to sponsor a child in some village. And you affect the lives of about a hundred million people a year. There's still more than two billion people who go to sleep every night with less than two dollars a day every night. So how do you maintain this optimism? Now, you're operating a massive organization that is tiny by the scale of human life. But you would also have a retail business motivating people what? You could say, I want one child, I'm going to help one. Well, you know, I, I often quote Mother Teresa, um, and if you look at human suffering, you know, you know, Mother Teresa was one of the reporters that said, uh, basically, so Mother Teresa you know, did all these stuff, and she said, you know, I want to serve the poor in my family. And the argument was more important to this today than it's not having to make those words that you don't do again. And Mother Teresa said, I told you, you just kind of ran through some doors and just said, yes, I'm going to go out there and tell them to do this stuff. Just tell them to do this and just kind of go on. So I think about that every day. Um, when I do my job, I'm doing it out of obedience and faithfulness to what God has laid before me to do. And I have to keep doing that for a lot of reasons. And so, uh, sometimes, some days we're more successful than others, and some days we're less. But hopefully, every day we're going to do And I choose to be an optimist. I, you know, there, there is a great progress in the world, and if you get discouraged frequently, don't go into those lines. Um, because you sometimes feel like you're trying to fail the way you've intended. Um, but if, I write in my book, I'll only about a mountain of mustard seed. And uh, in the church of Jesus, says that faith is larger than mustard seed can allow you to say to this mountain, fall into the ocean and it will. And see how the faith is larger than the mustard seed can fall into that seed. And I used to think, well, you know, that the faith is a really that grace in Jesus, you know, the faith that's inside the mountain, so you can't cast the mountain into the ocean. But then I started to think, what if you had a mountain of mustard seed? And what if every one of us with our little mustard seed is full of sticks and shovel? And you started shoveling that mountain and shoveling that mountain seed. You could throw a mountain seed into the city of the mountain called poverty, into the mountain called injustice, into the mountain called homelessness, into the mountain called ignorance. And uh, if you take that shovel, Come together with a mountain of mustard seed and 
So I was just wondering, could you elaborate on how like the gospel changes over time? How the gospel makes different organizations stand out from maybe the any other organization? How do you make a difference? First of all, you know, I think they try to get the two human beings to the different ones. They're not objects of our story, but it's about that the gospel is important. So they're creating a different environment. We have folks that work in the organization. If you look at that, you try to look at it in terms of the access. That God has placed in that community. So, in that same community, there might be a real world of the um, There may, may be another Albert Einstein, for example, who's the problem. There may be another something like that. Um, there are people with creativity, resourcefulness, and a rich culture, and they have so much access. Um, and what we try to do is actually be able to liberate those assets. We talk about fulfilling the God given potential. They're no different than people born in New York City or they are rich in assets. Real quick, one said to me, I guess some sort of person that I know, and said something like this about the Lord's organization. Capability and intellectual capacity and giftedness are evenly distributed in the world of opportunity and wealth. So these people that are just as gifted as you are now just don't have the opportunity. So, as Christians, we look at people with that lens, and we see the very clear questions and the very clear developments of what it is that we're supposed to do. Certainly, we're motivated by the Christian values. So, many of our staff are incredibly unselfish in the way they serve and feel that they are doing in a pleasant place. We live among the people who serve, so we don't live in a church place in the city. Our staff are in the world and the world and the world. But we do believe that the gospel is going to spread more to the next part of life because that they begin to feel that it's not having a different kind of different person. And so we think that we have a position for generosity and being more aggressive so we tend to flow more naturally and they don't force it. I've seen a number of people in our project that have become Christian. Last year in the world, a man who was a town drunk and was going to be his wife. Um, and the world is an agricultural thing, and we see more the church involvement these days than the black people in the church and the church and so on. Um, he ended up with a board, gave his life to the board. Um, today, he is like the head farmer of the little group, and he's the leader of the town, and he and his wife are. More than 65, five and seven years throughout uh, America, the Middle Eastern world. His wife is uh, familiar with other women in the United States, and she makes seven school and her seven sons. He's the same thing. I mean, and he sees his purpose in life now to help others, to build his community, to give back, and to serve God. So before we just sit down and run, and we were just sitting down and running the service. So that inside out transformation is often very, very powerful. 
again, we don't force it on people. Thank you for coming and giving your time to us. Um, I really appreciate what you said about the software setting in Google. Um, and then working with Google Rock here to see that you need these changes at that level. Because I've been reading both your books, five of them. Um, and the other ones that are out there on uh, kind of poverty and things. But one of the things I rarely hear addressed is the role of instability and deficits and tyranny in that whole picture. Uh, so much of the world trapped in poverty because of what we see at the government level, like North Korea, or, or the instability in South Sudan, or the on the here was a, a profiling of things in the Central African Republic and, and how things are deteriorating there. Um, do you have, and Dr. Bears, your thoughts too, do you have any thoughts on how we can address, because your access, availability, and awareness thing, there, there's a point where availability isn't there for us to make a difference because of the, the whole umbrella of tyranny over those situations. How do we approach that? Is there something that can be done at that level to free up the opportunity to come in and then change the individual suffering? That's a good question, Steve. And I also answer the question to put it out and touch on the world a little bit. Essentially, you're absolutely right. And poverty in these difficult places is often caused by an animal poverty. It's more, it's more of a malignant poverty than the other thing. It's the high poverty thing. It's like, you know, it's the solution to an economic poverty crisis. And uh, if you go see hungry, Gone at the war in the Congo or South Sudan or whatever, we can make tremendous progress in poverty because they have a relative enlightened democratic capitalist that is trying to make a, a better economy, a better life for their people, and a cooperative global economy for their people. And so we've got a, a wind in our backs, right? You know, we're, we can swing them and say, oh, we can get a lot more done in a place like Ghana where there's so many South Sudan and Congo that are sitting there. So what I said is that we're actually starting to believe in the vision that within the next 20 years, we will probably be able to just about every form of extreme poverty uh, in most of the easy countries, you know, Zambia, you know, Honduras, Costa Rica, Ghana, uh, and Botswana, with tremendous progress that's been made, and what will be left if we suffer this poverty, and it will be in these failed states. The the places like North Korea, the places like Somalia, the Russia, the places like the Congo, the places where there's either government corruption or downright despotism that we are just abusing our own people for whatever we're getting. And those are going to be the difficult places to live. And so I appreciate the Rabbi for the the big picture of it in terms of a legal operation. Well, let's say it's a Rabbi for everybody in the development world. Because it's dangerous to work there, access is limited. You can see 10 years of progress right down, wiped out as one rebel incursion. You know, the vehicles are stolen, and the buildings are burned, and the villages are scattered, and the animals are killed by dogs. You see that stuff as soon as the energy markets and things like that. So, what the world is going to have to confront is stubborn poverty and tragic state where there's a political solution is almost going to be mandatory before there can be any sort of poverty solution. Now, having said that, we, we work in those places. We're in Afghanistan. We're in North Korea. We're in China. We're in South Korea. We're moving into the Central African Republic and into South Asia. Because you can't abandon people in that way. You have to try. Because they are the most desperate of the world's poor. And, you know, if I say poverty is to the poorest of the poor, not the richest of the poor, right? And, uh, so that's where people are most desperate. That's where they confront the solution. So we try. And you know, people don't realize this, but every year on average, two war victims got into the film in one country. You know, two years ago, three years ago, seven of us got with simple automatic weapons in Pakistan and in the United States. Um, so it, it is dangerous work. It, it is quite a temptation. You know, we have people that are willing to risk their lives to get into those. Uh, 
thank you for the great lecture. And my name is Anton, and I'm from Bama, and I was a World Vision staff right now. And I think. Kind of believe in the principle that 
what is done in Myanmar is simply decided by the people who live there. Sometimes the support office of the can be a little bit pushy and uh, inclusive in certain parts of the world that we have. We actually do bring some perspective to this kind of thing for the table, but you know, our, our corporate philosophy is that really local governments are local decisions are the local players. But there is things have to be negotiated between the funders. We think we're going to get into the economy quickly, so I think we're going to have to wrap up and encourage people to step outside.